looks like aquilogenes fecalis couldn't ferment any of the sugars. And if we think about it, if we were inoculated in these guys, that's how we'd react, right? We can't survive by fermentation alone. So um, one, one possible hypothesis here is that aquilogenes fecalis could be a stricter obligate aerobe, right? Can't carry out fermentation, can't survive by fermentation, lacks the enzymes to carry out fermentation. So what tests could we run to verify our hypothesis that aquilogenes fecalis could be a stricter obligate aerobe. Which test did you run that could provide evidence to support that hypothesis? Yeah, so, oh my gosh, you guys, such beautiful, beautiful data. So to, um, to add evidence to support the hypothesis that aquilogenes fecalis could be a stricter obligate aerobe, you could run a field glycolate test and see uh, the pattern of growth. And what you all correctly observed is in Alphalagenes fecalis, it can only grow at the top of the tube where oxygen is present. So that supports a hypothesis that your Alphalagenes fecalis, it's a stricter obligate amos, right? Just like we would be if we got inoculated into the media. We can't carry out fermentation. And the pattern of growth in your theoglycolate supports that hypothesis, right? Now, it turns out that alkalogenes fecalis, and this is just so bizarre, I need to do some more uh, research into it. Apparently, it can't use sugars at all, which is just so bizarre, you know, because sugars usually are like the most common source of, of carbon and energy. So that's just very bizarre right there. But just based on our results, based on the fermentation results, we're like, wow, this organism can't carry out fermentation, looking more like a stricter obligate aerobe, run theoglycolate, and it's consistent with the hypothesis that, that uh, Alkalogenes is a stricter obligate aerobe. So gorgeous data, you guys. Well done. The Bacillus subtilis, we see that we get, we had acid production with glucose, acid production with sucrose, no acid production from lactose. So our our conclusion would be uh, Bacillus subtilis, it has enzymes to ferment glucose, it has sucrase, which permits it to also ferment suc uh, sucrose, but which enzyme does it lack? Why can't it ferment lactose? Beta exactly, beta-galactosidase. Mm -hmm. And this makes sense if we think how bacillus, the, the, um, the members of the genus bacillus evolved. They evolved primarily out in nature, in dead, decaying organic material. And so it makes sense that um, they, would, they wouldn't have been selected for production of beta-galactosidase because they didn't primarily evolve in the intestinal tract of mammals. And we want to remember, you guys, lactose is milk sugar. Okay, it's it's um, going to be primarily produced by mammals. Mammals make it so they can feed their babies, their young, right? And so we're mostly going to find lactose in the intestinal tract of mammals. So if bacteria haven't evolved to live in the intestinal tract of mammals, it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to produce beta galactosides, right? But in contrast, in nature, if the members of genus Bacillus have evolved to live in nature on dead plant material, Sucrose, we know, is plant sugar, right? It's one of the disaccharides produced by plants. So it does make sense there was selection pressure for uh, members of this genus to evolve sucrase so that it could use those plant sugars as a source of fermented energy. Good job, you guys. We also want to see that um, in the fermentation process, Bacillus subtilis doesn't uh, have the enzymes that would, that would produce either molecular hydrogen and or carbon dioxide during fermentation. So that's why you were gas negative on these guys. Good job. Okay, now E. coli from lecture, we know that E. coli has incredible metabolic diversity. As we mentioned, O2 is present, it uses aerobic respiration. No O2 present can switch to either anaerobic respiration or fermentation. Okay. And, and um, perhaps you vaguely remember, we said that E. coli has the enzymes to use mixed acid fermentation, uh, another fermentation pathway. And we've got a little chart over there that we'll be referring to um, for chapter 17 tests, and you'll see in mixed acid fermentation, E. coli has an enzyme called formate hydrogen lyase. It takes one of the intermediates of fermentation, formic acid, and splits it into molecular hydrogen and CO2. So that's why CO2, excuse me, that's why E. coli is such a great gas producer during fermentation, is it's producing lots of hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. And that's what you guys were observing in your Durham tube, was the collection of gas. So we see that E. coli 
can ferment glucose. And again, if a sugar is going to be fermented, usually it's going to be glucose with nice gas production here. Um, our particular strain, our particular strain of E. coli apparently lacks which enzyme? Sucrase, Sucrase right? So you saw that beautiful alkaline reaction, the, uh, the dark fuchsia color, which showed E. coli had to tear apart the amino acids. It's an alternate source of carbon and energy, releasing ammonia. So we had the pH go up and the phenol red turn um, that beautiful fuchsia color. Good. Um, now, E. coli has evolved to live in the intestinal tract of mammals. So it makes sense that E. coli has evolved which enzyme? Beta galactosidase, right? So E. coli can ferment lactose. And in nature, that's a relatively rare property, OK? Because again, we're only going to find lactose primarily in the intestinal tract of mammals. So only bacteria that have evolved in the intestinal tract of mammals, um, they were the only ones that really had so selection for evolution of beta galactosidase. Okay, and again, we saw that lovely gas production too. So um, understanding E. coli can carry out fermentation, what would be your prediction for growth in theoglycolate tubes? Would you predict you'd see E. coli growing well in the anaerobic butt or not? You'd predict it could grow in the anaerobic butt, right? Because it carries out fermentation. And what did you guys observe? This is beautiful data. You guys are natural born microbiologists. This is really lovely data. So you guys should give one a little pat on the back. That's really, really nice. Very nice data. Good. Okay, so just, just before we move on, you guys, um, I did put some more practice questions in the back of the room, practice questions for the lab practical. And I'll just, as a little break here, I'll just, I'll just remind you all that The first lab back from break is the second lab practical. I know, isn't that a killer? So um, we do want to remember, you know, all of these metabolic tests will be on the lab practical. We, we, um, we put some of the um, different types of selective differential plates in the back. Some of the early metabolic tests, or excuse me, some of the PR theoglycolate tests are back there. Some of the motility augers are back there. We've got, you know, the protozoa, the um, helminths, arthropod slides up. So just, just to remember that. And this Friday, you guys, will have a short open lab from 9 to 10.30. And of course, that will be the last open lab before the lab practical. Yeah, will these be out? Yeah, yeah, we'll put all these out. We'll have all these out. And while you guys are working um, to inoculate the next set of tests, I'll, tr I'll try to put some more practice stations up. Yeah. Okay, so just, just as a little break there. Okay. So with regard to your tubes, you guys, if you don't want to hold on to them, please make sure, please, 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 take all the tape off. Um, you doing it saves us hours and hours and hours of people, people work. So please take all your tapes off. Remember, you're going to um, barely loosen the caps, let them vent. And then please put them in the correct bins in the back. Notice their signs. One of the bins says slants and deeps, and the other one says broths. So please just take, it literally, it's just a few seconds for you guys to make sure that you get them in the right place. And that saves the folks that help us hours of work later. Yeah, so, um, okay. So we're going to um, inoculate another series of tests today, you guys. And again, we're going to still work in our teams of four. Teams of four. And again, I think you guys are going to love this. I mean, these things, they turn beautiful colors. It's really joyful. Um, whenever working in a lab, I can't wait to come in the next day to see what colors the auger has turned. You know, it's just like a little kid waiting to open a treasure box. So I hope you guys will have fun with these. So the next set of tests we're going to um, inoculate today are the Chapter 17 metabolic tests. We're calling this Metabolics Part 2. And the, um, the tests we're going to run are the Imgur series of tests. Um, we're going to inoculate triple sugar iron, auger slants, and we're going to run catalase tests. So what I'm going to be doing is kind of running between the board, our media, and then we have some charts that we put up on the sideboard to explain some of these tests. Okay, so the first series of tests we're going to explain are the IMPIC series of tests. IMPIC stands for four different tests. The I is for the indole test, the M is for the methyl red test, the V is for the Wilkowski-Hours test, and the C is for the Simmons citrate auger test. And um, 
And what you'll do as a team of four is you're going to inoculate one set of MDIG tests with our good friend E. coli. And Val and Carmen made us new plates, so we have E. coli plates up here. So um, one plate per team of four. And then you'll inoculate a second set of MDIG tests with E. coli's close cousin Enterobacter orogenes. And again, Val and Carmen made us new plates with Enterobacter orogenes. So please, you guys, we only have five plates of each organism. So in theory, it only means five teams. So please only take one plate of the organisms. And what I did, for those of you that don't want to wait, um, we held on to the plates from yesterday. But be aware they've been used by several lab sections already. But um, we do have the older plates if you're anxious. You know, you don't want to wait for a blood together plates. Okay. So um, let me just walk through each of these tests very quickly. Okay. Um, the indole test, you need not um, inoculate media. We have a really cool bench top test to run the indole test. And these are called indole dry slides. These are commercially prepared. And the indole dry slides, the reagents have been incorporated into a dry um, substrate. So each of the four little squares here have, have the reagents for the indole dry slide. What you'll do today is use aseptic technique to transfer some of your E. coli to the surface of one of the dry slides. Now you guys know we're in a budget crunch. So what we're going to ask you to do is put your bacteria in the corners of these little squares. That way we can, in theory, we can get 16 tests on one dry slide. Okay. Now, um, let me just go over to the chart to explain the um, idea behind an indole uh, dry slide and what a positive reaction would be, what a negative reaction would be. Okay, so the indole test, what we're, what we're asking is, can our microbes um, produce indole from the amino acid tryptophan. So this would be a sub substrate. To produce indole, your microbes must make the enzyme tryptophanase. So if your microbe makes tryptophanase, they'll take a tryptophan in their media and convert it to indole and other end products such as um, pyruvate and ammonia. The only one you need to remember, you guys, is indole. Now, if your organism made indole, it will combined with a substrate and indole dry slide, you do not need to memorize the name of the indole reagent, okay? but it's paradimethylaminogenaldehyde. So if indole is present, if your organism uh, made um, indole uh, using the tryptophanase, it will combine with the indole reagents, and you'll see a red or pink color on the indole dry slide. That's a positive indole test. It tells you your organism made tryptophanase. If your organism lacks tryptophanase, there'll be no indole, and the indole dry slide will not turn pink or red. So anything that's not pink or red is a negative, a negative test result. Okay. And you can run this in five minutes, so don't have to incubate anything. Great, great uh, slide test here. Okay, so that's the indole test. The next test, um, the next test you're going to run is a methyl red test. And the methyl red test is a test to determine if your organism makes the enzymes for mixed acid fermentation. Mixed acid fermentation, as the name suggests, is a fermentation pathway that converts sugars to a variety of acid, mixed acids. As a consequence, the pH is going to drop significantly below pH 4.4. So the way you're going to detect this really low pH is that you're going to inoculate MR broth, okay, MR broth, and um, they put a little red dot on the, the caps just to remind us this is methyl red broth. Use aseptic technique to inoculate your methyl red broth. Um, labels are so important, you guys. I should have said that right at the start. Make sure you have really good labels for all these tests. Um, after um, inoculating your test, just barely loosen the cap, put them in a well-labeled can, and then you're going to incubate it at 37 degrees Celsius. If your organism carries out mixed acid fermentation, they'll produce lots and lots of acids. So on Thursday, when you come in and pull your tests, to determine if you have pH below 4.4, which pH indicator could you add? Which pH indicator have we talked about will turn red at pH below 4.4? Methyl red, right, it's the name of the test. I love it, yes. Okay, so on Thursday, you pull your tubes out, and you would add methyl red pH indicator. If the broth turns red, you know the pH is below 4.4. You know mixed acid fermentation occurred. That's a positive methyl red test. 
If the media doesn't turn red, you know the pH is not below 4.4, you know your organism did not carry out mixed acid fermentation, that's a negative test. Now here's a problem, you guys, and we see this every semester with the unknown. People will incubate the test, they'll pull it out of the incubator, they'll go, huh, it's not red, it's negative. What mistake did they make? They forgot to add the methyl red. And that's so important, you guys, because when you do your unknowns, your bacterial unknowns, if you make that mistake, it might mess up your uh, entire um, identification um, process. So remember, you have to add methyl red after the cells have grown in the broth. Why can't we add methyl red ahead of time, like we do with phenol red, sugar fermentation media? Why can't we add the methyl red ahead of time? Any, any thoughts? It, it inhibits the growth of the bacteria. It's toxic, right? So we can't add the methyl red ahead of time. We have to let them grow first, and then we add the methyl red. Okay, but just be careful because a lot of times people forget to do it. So that's methyl red. So you inoculate one tube with E. coli, a separate tube with Enterobacter ragi. And remember, you guys, labels are so important. The next test is a test called the Vogue Proskauer's test. And this is a test for a second fermentation pathway. And oh, the names here are going to make you wild. Okay, this second fermentation pathway is called butylene glycol fermentation or 2,3-butane diol fermentation. And up here in our little chart, we have a summary of butylene glycol fermentation. And uh, organisms, they start with glucose. And during this butylene glycol fermentation, there's a unique, unusual intermediate form. And the fancy name is acetylmethylcarbonyl, but its nickname, which is totally perfect on a lab practical, is called acetone. Okay, so only organisms that carry out butylene glycol are going to make this unique intermediate called acetone. So that's what the vogue proskauer test is going to detect, is the presence of this unique acetone intermediate. So the way we're going to run the test, we're going to have you guys inoculate vogue proskauer's um, broth, Vogue Proskauer's media, and the stock room put a little blue dot on this. Now it turns out MR media and VP media, it's the exact same media. It's a, a glucose rich media, so we'll get lots of acids. But in the past, it always made our students crazy to be inoculating the same media for MR as for VP. So we just went ahead and called one MR and the other VP. Now the other importance is the VP test, um, after incubation, we're going to add more reagents, and the volume of the broth is important. So what Carmen and Val have done, they've made sure we have just the right volume of VP medium for the reagents that we're going to add. So it, it actually is important that you guys inoculate um, the, the, the blue cap tubes for the VP test. Okay, so if your organisms can carry out butylene glycol fermentation after incubation, there will be some acetoin present in the media. And what we're going to do is add two reagents, very toxic reagents, to see if we can detect the presence of that acetoin. And the two reagents we're going to add are called, the, the general term is vogue Proskauer's reagent A. And I want you to know that VP reagent A is alpha naphthol, nasty stuff. And the second reagent is called VP reagent B. And I want you to know that VP reagent B is 40% potassium hydroxide. And you guys know your moms would tell you that will burn your eyeballs out. And your mom would be right. So on Thursday, um, after you've pulled your tubes, you are going to gear up in your hazmat gear, okay, goggles, gloves, coat, and your shoes. And we'll take our tubes over to the safety hood. And it's only in the safety hood that we're going to add our reagents. On Thursday, I'll show you how to add the reagents. Now, the, the, because these reagents are so toxic, if you're pregnant, you think you might be pregnant, you're trying to get pregnant, you aren't going to do the hands-on. I'm going to be your stupid robot. And that is, you know, I can, I can use my hands, but I don't know what to do. So you will stand back, and you're going to guide me, your robot, what I need to do to add the reagents to the tubes. Okay? And like I said, we'll, we'll describe the process on Thursday. In addition, if any of you just don't like the idea of working with these hazardous chemicals, I'll be your stupid robot too. But the same thing, you have to tell me exactly what to do, but I'll be the hands-on robot for you. Okay. So if your organism carried out butylene glycol fermentation, when we add the alpha naphthol and 40% potassium hydroxide, they'll interact with the acetoin, and within an hour, you'll see a beautiful red color form at the air-broth interface. 
Okay, so in the VP test, red again is positive. No red is negative. Okay. Now, remember how we're always trying to come up with default answers because often when we're taking these exams, we're so tired. Okay, did you see a pattern here, you guys, in the first three of the Invict tests? What was positive for indol? What was positive for methyl red? Red. What was positive for VP? Red. Okay, so on the last practical day, if you're brain dead because you didn't get any sleep, and we're asking you what is the appearance of a positive Invict test, three times out of four, you'll be right if you say red. Red. Okay, so good default answer for Invict. You know, default answer Invict. You don't, can't think, just say red. And three times out of four, you'll be correct. Now, the only time you wouldn't be correct is for the last test of the Invict test, the citrate test. And we're using this beautiful media called Simmons Citrate Auger. And what you're going to do with the Simmons Citrate Auger is you're going to use aseptic technique and you're going to um, streak the slant. Okay. Now, Simmons Citrate Auger, it's this beautiful green color because the pH indicator is brown thymol blue. And you guys might remember brown thymol blue it, around neutral pH, it's green. Mm -hmm. Now, through a complicated series of events, if your organism can use citrate as its sole source of carbon and energy, and um, to do that, usually it has to make an enzyme called citrase, um, will have a final alkaline pH. Do you guys remember what color brown thymol blue turns at alkaline pH? Blue. Beautiful deep blue, blue color, deep blue color. Um, some folks call it Prussian blue, others call it Levi, Levi jeans blue. It's really gorgeous blue. So for the citrate test, using Simmons citrate auger, blue is a positive test, meaning your organism can use citrate as a sole source of carbon and energy, and not blue is a negative test. Okay, so those are the Invict tests. And again, as a team of four, you'll inoculate one set of Invict tests with E. coli, and then you'll inoculate a second set of tests with Enterobacter orogenes. Okay, so again, labels are so important there. All right, the next test we're going to describe is a catalase test. This is a quick and fun test, you guys. Um, the catalase test is to see if your organism makes the protective enzyme catalase. And you might want to maybe even review your notes from Chapter 6, Microbial go Growth. You guys remember that when microbes grow in aerobic environments, um, they are at risk of dying from those reactive oxygen intermediates like superoxide anion, hydrogen peroxide. So we discussed that um, organisms that evolved to live in an aerobic environment, they evolve protective enzymes. And one of them is catalase. So we got a little cartoon over here, and you all might remember from lecture, catalyze, cat, cat, catalyze, well catalyze the reaction where hydrogen peroxide will be broken down into water and molecular oxygen. Okay, and molecular oxygen is a gas. So the way you're going to detect the presence of catalase, again, this is a bench top test. You get a clean microscope slide, and, and Val and Carmen gave us some extra slides. You'll put a drop, or actually, excuse me, well, Originally, we were going to have you put two drops of hydrogen peroxide on your slide. Okay. And we have two sources of hydrogen peroxide up here. We have these little dropper bottles. Okay, so you can use that. And again, you guys, make sure you read the labels because we're going to end up with lots of different bottles with different reagents. So make sure you read the label, 3% hydrogen peroxide. You can use the dropper bottles. Or we have some aliquots of hydrogen peroxide in these um, labeled test tubes. And with those, you can just use a little transfer pipe. So initially, we are going to have you test two different bacteria. So initially, we're going to have you put um, two separate drops of the 3% hydrogen peroxide on your slide. Unfortunately, one of our microbes didn't grow. So today, all you need to do is put one drop of 3% hydrogen peroxide on your slide. And then you'll use aseptic technique to transfer, and the only organism we have for you today um, to test is Staphylococcus epidermidis. So you'll use aseptic technique to transfer your Staphylococcus epidermidis into the drop of 3% hydrogen peroxide. You want to withdraw your loop and look for bubbles to form. Now, um, if your organism is catalase positive, you will see bubbles. And what are those bubbles, you guys? Oxygen. Yeah, the molecular oxygen. Okay, so that's your sign the organism um, produces catalase. What we want you to remember is all members of the genus Staphylococcus are all catalase positive. 
So that includes Staphylococcus epidermidis, the one you're working with today. It includes Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus aureus. Now, the organism that did grow was a member of the genus Streptococcus. We were going to give you Streptococcus lactis, but it, it pooped out on us. It didn't grow. But the important thing to remember is all members of the genus Streptococcus, they're all catalase negative. They don't make catalase. <coughs> So if, if it was growing on a plate, you would mix it with your hydrogen peroxide, nothing would happen. So I guess if one of these guys wasn't going to grow, it was good the streptococcus didn't grow. Okay, but do you remember, you guys, on the lab practical, that all members of the genus staphylococcus are catalase positive, all members of the genus streptococcus are catalase negative. And in diagnostic um, bacteriology labs, this is a quick test that lets you distinguish gram-positive cocci. Um, it lets you distinguish, could they be a staphylococcus catalase positive, or could they be a streptococcus catalase negative? Does the hydrogen peroxide destroy the streptococcus? Oh, when it, it is, excuse me, it is somewhat antimicrobial, um, so you might get some cell death, but I would never presume that hydrogen peroxide would kill all staphylococcus. Okay. I mean, Oh, the str oh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, so streptococcus, they don't make catalase, but they, they make a similar enzyme called peroxidase. So peroxidase, likewise, can detoxify, break down hydrogen peroxide. It just doesn't produce molecular oxygen. Thank you. I'm sorry. I missed. Yeah. Yeah, so the streptococcus, they have an alternate enzyme to break down hydrogen peroxide. And you guys might remember from um, lecture that the genus Streptococcus, they're called aerotolerant anaerobes. All they can do is carry out fermentation. But they do have some protective enzymes. That's why they can still grow in aerobic environments. Yeah, good question. Okay, so that's a catalase test. So all you guys will be doing today is just testing the Staphylococcus epidermidis and looking for those bubbles. Okay. The last test you guys are going to run is the, you're going to inoculate TSI auger slants. And TSI, lab practical question, you guys, what does TSI stand for? It stands for triple sugar, means three sugars, iron. So we want to explore um, the contents of these tubes. Now, they're beautiful tubes. You'll see that they're big butt slants, okay? So there's a lot of auger in the deep, okay, big butt slants, and we'll explain why in a little bit. The triple sugars, you need to know, they're glucose, lactose, and sucrose, the same sugars we ran in our PR tests. The reason the media appears red is phenol red is the pH indicator. Okay, so one of the, um, one ways we use triple sugar iron is to, um, is to look for sugar fermentation. So what you guys are going to do is using aseptic technique and using your needles, using your needles, you'll harvest cells from your plates and you're going to do a stab. You're going to stab the butt. Try not to touch the glass bottom. If you do, don't panic, but just try not to touch the glass bottom. You'll do a stab of the butt to get your microbes growing anaerobically. Then you're going to withdraw slightly, and then you're going to slant the street because you also want your microbes to grow aerobically. So on Thursday when you pull these, we'll, we'll describe the colors and how the patterns of color tell you which sugars were fermented. Now, the second reason we're inoculating triple sugar iron slants is to check for hydrogen sulfide production. Okay. And you, might, you guys might remember in lecture we said hydrogen sulfide, it's toxic. It binds to cytochromes. It stops electron transport and electron transport chains. So obviously, we don't want you guys detecting hydrogen sulfide production by opening the tubes and sniffing them, right? To see, oh, do I smell rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide? That's not a good thing. You, know, you guys, that's not good for you. So what the microbiologists figured out was that if they incorporate iron salts into this media, okay, and that's what the I stands for, triple sugar iron, it contains iron salts, the iron salts will combine with hydrogen sulfide. And as an end product, you'll get iron sulfide. And this is not a gas. In fact, it's a solid, so it actually precipitates out of the medium and forms a black, a black color in the butt. Okay. So on Thursday, you're going to pull your tubes, you'll hold them with the light, and you're going to see, do I see a black or brown uh, color in the butt? Um, 
And if you do, that tells you iron sulfide is present. If iron sulfide is present, that tells you hydrogen sulfide was produced. So it's kind of an indirect way to determine hydrogen sulfide production. Now, there's two ways that hydrogen sulfide could be produced. One is through anaerobic respiration. Some organisms can carry out anaerobic respiration in which sulfates are the alternate electron acceptor, so SO4. And what happens when the sulfates get reduced, they'll get reduced all the way down to hydrogen sulfide. Okay, so this is one reason we want you to stab the butt, so we'll force your microbes to grow anaerobically, and maybe we'll get some hydrogen sulfide produced. An alternate way to produce hydrogen sulfide is through the breakdown of sulfhydryl-containing amino acids. So, so we have breakdown of sulfhydryl, and you guys remember that that's a SH functional group, sulfhydryl-containing sulfhydryl containing amino acids such as cysteine. So this is an alternate way that um, hydrogen sulfide can be uh, produced. When that sulfhydryl group gets ripped off, the cysteine gets released as hydrogen sulfide. Now the reason I wanted to bring that up is this sometimes will occur when the organisms are growing aerobically. So sometimes you'll see, if you let them incubate long enough, you might see a black or brown precipitate along the slant. And I think that's evidence that you've got the breakdown of um, sulfhydryl containing amino acids. Okay, all right. So again, just to review you guys for the triple sugar irons, you're gonna use your inoculating needles, use aseptic technique. You're gonna stab and streak one of your TSI slants with Proteus mirabilis. And again, Val and Carmen provided plates here. And the second TSI slant, you're going to do a stab and streak with our good friend E. coli. Okay, so you'll be using your E. coli plate, you know, multiple times. Okay, with all of these, you guys, again, labels are so important. The name of the organism, the date, the lab section, and at least the name of one member of your team so we can track them back. Make sure that um, almost all of these tubes are screw cap tubes, so make sure... You tighten them and then barely loosen them so they can vent. Make sure they go into labeled cans, okay? And then all of these will be going into the 37 degree incubator, okay? And again, you folks, it's important to go in um, our two stage. There is an incubator, there's a middle one. The reason that becomes important is when we do our unknowns, we'll be turning off the incubators on different days to make sure the tests don't incubate too long, okay? All right, you guys, so any questions? Okay, I know it's a lot, but oh, you're going to love the results. Do make sure you guys, before you leave, wash your hands, spray down your benches, because most of these are opportunistic pathogens, okay? So we don't want you guys getting sick right here at the end of the semester. Okay. Right, Tina, thanks. It's the right number. I asked John. It is the right number? Okay, let's see. Over here and look into that guy. I like to sleep. <laughs> I was actually sleeping again. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. Maybe I was, I was bit, bitten by the, uh, what's it called?